And so I think that, you know, the folks, folks in SAFs get exposed uh, to a, kind of a, a lot of different potential Bayesian classes. Um, just by a show of hands, how many, how many folks have ever used Bayesian methods before um, or taking classes at SAFs using Bayesian methods? Maybe a couple? Okay, good. Um, well, it's a good mix of, of folks who I think that, you know, we certainly have no expectations that people have been exposed to um, Bayesian methods. And so I, I thought what I would do today is going to be um, to primarily start talking about um, kind of the background of, of Bayesian methods, why we, why we use this kind of estimation. And then um, on Thursday, we'll talk about more multivariate methods. And um, there's the, the neon forecasting challenge that Eli and Mark were talking about as a potential class project. Um, that's really going to be the focus of what we're going to do for lab on Thursday, which is kind of fun because it's it's um, you know there there is no right answer and it's um, it's it's definitely very applied. Um, there's there's kind of this competition to forecast some different types of um, oxygen and temperature data from lakes and and, and a river. So um, so that's kind of the 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 gist of what we'll be doing. Um, let's see. Um, so. The, uh, the software that I'll post links to at the end of class today is going to be um, this program called STAN that's become pretty popular. Um, and developing the kind of the Bayesian part of this class has been fun over the last few years because I think when we first started teaching the class back in um, maybe 2011 or 2013, STAN wasn't around yet. Um, you know, the, the, the best Bayesian um, estimation software that was easy to use at the time was, was JAGS or, or WinBugs, which, which folks are probably you know, familiar with. And so, um, so we developed a series of labs and lectures kind of oriented around um, using, using the JAGS software. Um, I still think you know, JAGS is really good for all kinds of, all kinds of problems. Um, it's, uh, the scripts are very simple. And so I think if, if you're intimidated by Stan or wanna try JAGS too, um, all of that stuff is still on the website. It still is current and, and works. Um, the biggest difference, and there's kind of some big pros and cons, I think, in my mind. Um, Stan is Stan is much faster. Um, both of the both of the models let you develop very flexible, um, different kinds of models that we can talk about. Um, Jags uh, to run a Jags model, you always have to write the the model script yourself, and so you have to. You have to know JAG syntax and um, be able to have this model file compile. Um, in Stan, there's a number of packages that I'll talk about that allow us to, um, to basically fit Stan models using conventional uh, syntax like you would with a GLM or a linear model. Um, and so it's, it's very flexible, very user-friendly because of that formula interface. Um, and then I think you know, the, the, other, the other kind of benefits of, of Stan in my mind are um, the developer and user community is really great. So there's a huge, um, a huge message board with all kinds of um, folks who are addressing problems and and asking. Um, you know, the, the pe people are very helpful in in kind of answering problems and and helping with solutions. Um, and then I think that the um, you know when you run a Jags model, if you, if you're familiar with Jags at all, um, you generally can uh, can expect almost no help with respect to trying to find a, a bug in your code. And so. If your program, if your bug, if your if your code crashes for some reason, um, uh, you get kind of a, a an error warning that doesn't necessarily tell you the line number or the type of error that's being uh, being encountered. But with Stan, the messages, the error messages um, are very clear, telling you exactly what line um, problems are occurring on and what the problem is. And so I think it's it's way quicker to debug a Stan program these days than it is a Jags uh, Jags model. So. Um, so this, this um, you know, the, the switch to Stan occurred maybe in 2015 or so, um, and we've been developing it since. It's fun because, um, you know, every time we do this, um, the, the kinds of models that are available um, and the, the user friendliness increases uh, quite a bit. So we'll just talk about some examples. Um, because I've kind of broken this into a univariate and a multivariate, um, lecture on Tuesday and Thursday. Today we'll be largely be talking about the kind of the univariate regression type models, um, the ARMA models that are, are um, you know, in the time series world with autoregressive or moving average models. Um, we'll talk about state space models and then dynamic linear models where we have a, a random walk in an intercept or a slope parameter, for example. 
And then on Thursday, um, we'll get it more into the, the dynamic factor analysis as a multivariate example, um, and then some multivariate time series models, um, which, uh, which we're also kind of working with. Um, so, uh, so we've, you know, we're at this point in the class, we're halfway done, um, where everybody's very familiar, I think, with kind of what the Mars package has to offer. Um, the Mars is, you know, very fast for estimation. It's very flexible in that you can let, um, you know, you put all kinds of constraints on different, um, different parameters and um, estimate things as being time varying. I think where, um, where we kind of run up against a, um, a boundary in Mars is that um, it, it, you know, there's a limitation in terms of how, how complicated we can make things. So if we want to fit a model with hierarchical parameters and let there be, say, random effects um, in slopes among populations, or if we wanted to have, um, you know, any kind of non-normal response. So if you have a, um, you know, count data that's Poisson distributed or presence absence data that's bi binomial, um, you know, Mars obviously can't handle that. Um, and then if we have if we have prior information, and so that's another strength of kind of the Bayesian Bayesian worldview is that if we have data from other studies that might help us inform some of our our parameters and constrain them, we can pull that information in with 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 the prior. Um, we can, uh, you know, all of the output from a Bayesian uh, model is then in terms of probabilities. So we can ask, you know, things that are useful for management or questions like, what's the probability that that um, that a fish stock or a population is going to be less than some some threshold, which would um, make us kind of, uh, you know, put put tighter restrictions on fishing. Um, another benefit I think is that you know, with with Mars, um, we or the maximum likelihood estimation. We can generate confidence intervals on some of the parameters in the model fairly fairly quickly, but to get to get kind of full confidence intervals, uh, we have to do bootstrapping, which can take uh, a really long time. In the Bayesian model, uh, because because all the all the parameters in the Bayesian um, uh, model are, are distributions or have distributions underlying them, we can generate our uncertainty intervals in in terms of. Um, uh, you know, the, the Bayesian credible intervals are analogous to confidence intervals. And those credible intervals get generated as we as we perform the estimation rather than doing it in two steps where we do the estimation first and then we do the bootstrapping second to generate those um, those uncertainty intervals. Um, so the Bayesian logic, um, you know, I don't have a lot of equations describing this. Um, this is basically all folks need to understand where it's all based on conditional probability. And so the first line here, um, we have our, our parameter, which I'm just denoting theta, and our data are y. And so um, you know, the, prob the conditional probability, the probability of, of theta given y times the probability of y um, is the same thing as these things reversed over here, you can see. So, um, so this is probability of theta given times the probability of theta given y. Um, so these two things are, are equivalent. And if we just divide both sides by PY or the probability of, of the data, um, we get what is, is on the second line here. And this thing on the second line is really what's called Bayes' formula. And so I think um, you know, we're not going to be talking about uh, the, the formula or anything for this class, but this is, this is essentially what we're talking about um, in terms of uh, you know, the conditional probabilities. The term on the denominator here, the probability of the data, is a normalizing constant that we're not gonna not gonna really worry about for most applications, unless you're really dealing with some um, you know uh, model selection like comparing models using Bayes factors. You don't really have to worry about um, the probability of the data. That's usually just omitted from this equation. Um, and so I think uh, we'll just focus on th these kind of top three terms. The term on the left just represents the probability of the data, or probably of the, the parameters given our data, um, which is the posterior distribution of the parameters. The, the first term on the right side is the probability of theta, which is just our prior, uh, prior probability of the parameter. And then the second term is the likelihood, which is the probability of the data given the parameter. Um, in the maximum likelihood, uh, estimation framework, this is the only term that, that we, we use. Um, and we need the prior, uh, we need the prior to be included here to be able to express the, this probability of the, of the parameters conditioned on the data. Okay. Um, this is a funny cartoon from a few years ago um, that is, uh, you know, just a, a silly thing um, talking about the difference between frequentist and Bayesian methods. 
um, you know, this is just a, a device that that basically um, will roll two two dice, and if they both come up six, then um, then the machine uh, lies, and but otherwise tells the truth. And so um, it it basically it just answers the question: Did the sun just explode? And so um, what you see here is on you know the frequent disk at the bottom says, well, it's a one in thirty six chance. Um, the probability of, of that is less than a p equal 0.05, so I conclude the sun's exploded. Um, and that's not really that's not really how we uh, you know this is a silly silly example, but that's not really how we think about things in the Bayesian framework. So um, um, the way I like to think about it is you know when we think about the prior and think about the posterior, um, the the difference between the two is kind of a measure of how much we how much we learn or how much we update our opinion by collecting data. And so I think, um, and this is just a simple example with a, a coin flipping uh, case where um, if we, if we, if I asked you, um, if I gave you a coin um, you know, and asked you to flip it eight times in this case, your prior belief would probably be that it was a fair coin and that your, the, that, that probability would be um, shown with kind of the, the green region here. But after eight flips, uh, we get six heads, two tails. So we update our, our, we update our kind of our expectation, our belief about that parameter. And so um, that would be kind of what's shown in the purple region. So that's, that's the difference. The, the difference between the purple and the, the green is essentially what we learn by collecting more data. Um, another kind of difference between the two, I think, is that the maximum likelihood estimation, when we're, when we're maximizing the likelihood, we're finding um, the absolute best point on the likelihood. So we're, we're trying to find the set of parameters that, that, um, that yields the, the, the best overall likelihood. Um, in the Bayesian uh, estimation, we're using, instead of using maximization to find kind of the, the best, the best, about, the best uh, set of combination, the best, uh, the best likelihood on that surface, we're using integration to find kind of the, the set of parameters that's the best on average. So that's that's a subtle but very important difference. Um, that that difference is you know in, in a lot of cases when we're performing uh, Bayesian estimation, we can, can get very similar answers to uh, what we would get with maximum likelihood. So if we're doing um, straight linear regression with an intercept and a slope, um, the estimates are going to be identical. Um, but I think things get a little bit more complicated once we start dealing with um, more complicated nonlinear models or, um, or situations where there's trade-offs between parameters. And so I think one of the, one of the examples, one, one of the best examples with this class and thinking about trade-offs uh, in parameters is thinking about um, is in, in state space models, we have kind of two sources of uncertainty. We have an observation variance and a process variance. And um, you know they can they only add up to so much, and so I think when we are trying to fit either approach um, to the data, um, you know the model takes the total variance and tries to split it between these two pieces. So in um, in the maximum likelihood setting, we can sometimes get cases where one of the variances uh, will go to zero, and so I think we've seen that with with Mars. There's some data sets or some combinations of models and data sets where uh, we get these de degenerate um, estimates because one of those two variances goes to zero and the model just can't converge or or that's what it's converged on and and that has just a high, really high likelihood. So I think looking at this this kind of plot on the right here, this represents um, the log posterior, which is which is um, you know it's it's approximately the same as the log likelihood. but we see the log posterior, the the two axes here are observation error on the x-axis and process error standard, de standard deviation on the y-axis. We see we get really high for this state space model. This is just a simple random walk. Um, and we get very high likelihood uh, when, the pro when the observation error is close to zero um, and the process error is high. So the model wants to take all of the, um, all the uncertainty and throw it into that process error uh, and minimize the observation error. But even though that has the highest likelihood, so that's kind of where we would expect the maximum likelihood estimates to um, to converge. Um, the, because what we're doing in the Bayesian uh, estimation scheme is is finding we're we're integrating and we're finding the parameters that that are best on average. What we wind up with actually is the dis distribution that's over here in yellow 
um, that kind of is, is balancing both of those values. So um, this plot on the left is, is incorporating, of course, other parameters, um, and it's incorporating um, you know, any of the prior information that we had put on these parameters. So that's, um, I think that the, the point of illustrating this is that um, you know, often in the kinds of models that we use, even really simple ecology models like a logistic growth model that has a, you know, a, a growth rate R and a carrying capacity K, there's a really known trade, really well-known trade-off between those two parameters that results in kind of this banana-shaped curve um, that has a really funny um, likelihood surface um, that results in kind of a similar shape. Um, State-based models with observation and process errors do the same thing. And so I think anytime you have a situation where the likelihood is, is you have this, this, these kinds of trade-offs between parameters or, or relationship between likelihood and the parameters of interest, you're going to get um, you know, these subtle differences between maximum likelihood and Bayesian approaches. Hey, uh, Eric, can I chime in for a sec? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you just show that figure there. So, um, so like in the lab manual and in this talk, you're going to see examples of models that you could fit with, with Mars and that you have fit with Mars. Um, this feature that Eric just showed of how easy, if, if you fit the same exact same model, you can set it up so it comes out with the, the same answers. Um, uh, by by set it up, I mean you set up the an uninformative prior. Um, that's what I mean there. Um, so you're getting the same answer, but the Bayesian method, because you can look at those posteriors like this, it's really powerful for understanding if you've got problems in your models model. So some of you, when you get your feedback on your, or you might. Uh, on your um, proposal, we may have a comment like, oh, you know, those two things are confounded. And that this is what confounded looks like. And this is a, fitting your model in a Bayesian framework, even if you're not using priors, or even if you're not using error structures that um, are non-normal. And so you, you need to use Bayesian for that reason. Um, you know, using the Bayesian framework to understand the structure of your likelihood surface is, um, is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any, any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Eli. Um, so, um, so yeah, the goal of, of doing this Bayesian estimation is to, to draw samples from, um, from that posterior distri distribution, the probability of our, our data, probability of theta given our y. Um, for very, very simple models, uh, we can write the analytical, analytical solution down to the posterior and just use the, the sampling functions in R to do that. And so I think like with the coin flip example that I, I showed a couple slides ago, um, you know, I, I was there is there's a very simple known solution for that. That's just a beta binomial distribution. Um, but in the real world, um, you know, I never am able to use those fancy tricks. Um, I always have to use uh, more complicated approaches because we can't write down the we can't write down this distrib distribution, the probability of, of theta given y. So for for basically everything that I have to work on. Um, you know, we need to generate our simulations from this distribution with simulation. And the way we do that is with Markov chain Monte Carlo. And, and so um, there's a number of other approaches that we can use to do the estimation, but, um, but that or, you know, that, that's MCMC. That's probably the most, the most uh, popular method. And so the way that MCMC works is um, you know, it's easy to kind of visualize this in one dimension where we, we, we just want to estimate, say, a mean, a single parameter for a model. This is kind of what the likelihood surface looks like with respect to that parameter. And so um, with MCMC, the first thing we do is just, um, you know, we, we generate a starting value. And so that's what this red point represents. Um, and then from that red point, we're going to say, um, you know, if we were doing this in a maximum likelihood setting, we would say, um, you know, we would take a step to the left and a step to the right and ask if we're increasing um, and we would go in that direction. But in the Bayesian, um, uh, in, using MCMC, what we're gonna do is from that red point, uh, we're, we're gonna say, we're gonna jump three steps to left or three, and we're gonna, we're gonna, so we'll jump three steps uphill and we'll say, you know, is this spot, um, 
you know, better, uh, better, better, or worse than we than we were. If it's better, we'll stay there. And even if it's worse, um, we'll jump with some acceptance probability. So uh, we're not necessarily not necessarily going to discard it if it's worse than where we were before. And so, um, so that uh, proposal will be accepted. We'll do the same thing again and jump. And you can imagine uh, if we perform this, this series of jumping, um, you know, a thousand or ten thousand times. Um, you know, we're going to get a whole surface of, of points that we're going to evaluate. Um, and maybe none of them will fall exactly on the maximum likely estimate. They'll all be kind of dancing around it. But I think what we're interested in is that dis distribution of points um, and how the parameters, how, how the parameter values in those distributions uh, correspond to the likelihood. And so if we were to take those and over our, you know, do a thousand jumps and plot what that, that would look like over time, we'd end up with a, you know, a, a plot like this, which is kind of what a MCMC chain looks like. Um, so the parameters on the y-axis and each of our jumps are on the x. And each jump just depends on where we were one time step before. But there's um, there's very little autocorrelation here. Um, these, these points are just random. So this is kind of what a nice, um, you know, if, if you have a really well-behaved MCMC chain, it should look like, look like this, basically. Um, so in terms of best practices, um, you know, like MCMC methods like maximum likelihood can, can get stuck in kind of local minima or, or local maxima sometimes. And so I think um, sometimes with maximum likelihood, we have to start, uh, an est you know, start estimation from several different starting values um, and repeat it, you know, a large number of times um, to, to find kind of our best, our best likelihood. Um, MCMC is no different. It's often best to, to you know, run three or four MCMC chains in parallel where you start every chain from different starting values. Um, and ideally they'll all, they'll all kind of wander around to, the, to the, the same solution in the end. So that's kind of the, the ideal uh, world. Um, for each of those chains, um, they may all start in, in kind of lousy, st lousy um, uh, starting values. And so we do what's called a burn-in, where we we will sample, say, a thousand values, and we'll throw out the first maybe half of those, uh, which is just kind of our warm-up or our burn-in period. Um, if we uh, another another situation that can arise, especially especially with these state-space models or or these problems where things are confounded, um, or we we have we have uh, where models might be overparameterized, and so we have um, the models are are too complex for the data. And aren't really informed by them. Uh, we can have situations where our parameters um, uh, just kind of, you know, they don't they don't generate the the nice um, what's called a trace plot that I showed before. Um, they they have these kind of long um, uh, long chains that kind of very slowly wander through the parameter space and have really high levels of autocorrelation. And so I think those are generally situations where the the model is not well suited for the data. But one way you can kind of fix that is to apply thinning uh, to reduce that autocorrelation. And so thinning just means if we, if we go out and we, we sample a thousand, uh, you know, a thousand steps in our MCMC chain, and um, you know, when we look at that plot, things look really autocorrelated, maybe we'll save every 20th uh, parameter value or every 100th parameter value which is a really inefficient way to, to do that sampling, but it will get rid of that, that, um, that autocorrelation. So I think um, that's a situation where we, we hopefully won't um, you know, encounter with, with your projects or, or things, but um, for, the, for, the, for most of the problems that I work on, I don't, I don't generally have to worry about it because there's other ways to, to, to make the model perform better than, um, than having to, to throw out a bunch of samples. Um, okay, so there's a, a lot of different different ways to generate um, samples from the posterior. Um, some of the some of the original were these Metropolis or Metropolis Hastings algorithms, which are um, are in, available in R. There's a MCMC pack library that's that's useful. Um, Metropolis Hastings is very flexible. It's also very slow and inefficient. So um, so you often will have to generate millions and millions of proposed draws to, to get, um, you know, a, a posterior distribution that's converged. Um, this, this SIR algorithm is something that's taught in some of the, the fisheries classes. It's useful for, um, it can be useful for 
fairly simple problems that have you know a, a half dozen parameters. But if you have uh, models that are, that are more complex, um, SIR is, is probably not a great approach. Um, the, the type of MCMC that we'll be talking about uh, today is especially called uh, what's, what's called the no-U-turn sampler. And I think um, that's, that's kind of what the, the machinery that uses, the, the machinery in STAN is really that, that nut sampling. Um, if, if you're not familiar with that, um, there was a former PhD student in SAFS, uh, Cole Monahan, that published this paper in 2016 in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. It's a really good, really good primer for people who are interested in, in just kind of learning about this. And there's some good visualizations about how nuts works compared to conventional MCMC. So I think that's a really good, a really good background for um, for learning more about this. Um, so what's Stan? Um, so it's uh, you know Stan is this. It's a language. Um, we'll talk more about it and get a little bit uh, more into the weeds on Thursday. But we're not going to really look at specifically look at Stan code today. Um, so it's a powerful, you know, cross-platform, cross-language uh, tool. You can call it directly from R or Julia or MATLAB or a bunch of other uh, types of types of code. Um, you write a, a, a stand script that has syntax that's kind of similar to C++. Um, and then using that code, you can you can do either full Bayesian inference and estimation, or you can do what's um, uh, you can, or you can do uh, uh, apply optimization routines to kind of maximize the posterior. And so today we'll largely be talking about the Bayesian estimation. Um, I think I'm going to try to show an example of the the posterior optimization on Thursday because it's a it's a very fast and potentially powerful uh, way to check models initially. Um, the Stan homepage is great. As I said, there's a really good user group um, and uh, you know message board for for getting help with models. Um, the, the package RSTAN is really flexible for calling it from R, which is generally the way that I've, I've been uh, interfacing with STAN. Um, and then the manual is, is really exceptional. They have, it's, uh, I don't remember how many pages it is. I think it's over 300 pages now, but it's got uh, all kinds of different models. Um, there's a whole chapter there on time series models. Um, and um, the, 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 uh, the list of case studies that they're adding to is just growing. Uh, you know, growing on a monthly basis. So I think it's a really, uh, really good resource. Um, the options for using Stan in this class are going to be that we can, you know, write our own code, which is, uh, you know, probably beyond the scope of, of this class. Uh, we can use an existing R package. Um, or over the last, um, you know, four or five years, uh, we've also kind of developed a series of R packages that are on the course repository that will uh, bundle a bunch of these scripts and let us kind of work with them without actually having to, to, to really get, get our hands dirty and, and work with the actual code. Um, so there's, there's two packages that I wanted to highlight in kind of the R universe that are, are really useful for fitting stand models. And so I think the, the, um, the ones I would, I would kind of feature are uh, what's called R stand arm. And so uh, that's, that's the first one. R stand arm lets you fit um, you know, linear models and generalized linear models um, and mixed effects versions of both of those in a Bayesian sense. And so the, um, you know, the, the exact functions are just stan, stan LM, stan glim, et cetera. Um, the other, and, and so the, and, you know, you, this is very flexible. It's also um, lets you fit hierarchical models using the formula interface, like you would with the, uh, you know, lemur or, GLMM, TMB, or these other types of packages. So it's, it's, uh, it's very flexible and powerful. The other, um, the other package is BRMS. Um, and both of these packages are uh, developed by the STAN developers. And so they, they play well together. And they, um, you know, the output from these models is something that's very easy to include into other packages for plotting, et cetera. Um, the, so the BR, BRMS package extends RSTAN ARM to, uh, to do a bunch of uh, amazing things. Um, I think when we were first teaching this class, um, you know, the, the, the list of things or list of reasons why you shouldn't use BR, BRMS was, was, was pretty long. There were, um, there were a bunch of limitations, but I think now, um, you know, the, the list of, of, of things that includes has, has grown um, exponentially over the last few years. Um, so now it includes all kinds of uh, autocorrelated error structures, non-normal data, 
you can include, uh, you can fit basically Bayesian GAMS, uh, which is something that, um, that a lot of packages uh, can't do. Um, um, so you can fit uh, basically anything for univariate data. It's a great resource. I use it uh, all the time. I think probably the only, the only kind of situation where BRMS won't meet your needs is where, uh, where you have multivariate data or multivariate time series. And so BRMS will let you use kind of group level, um, group level parameters. And so if you have, uh, for example, if you're fitting a model and you have, um, uh, you wanna estimate like a, a time series model with, uh, with an a, as an AR1 process, you can let the AR1 process vary by group but that's about the extent of the, of the time series models that they're including there. So, um, so uh, it's somewhat, somewhat limited. Um, the notation, as I said before, it should be very familiar for anybody who's used um, you know, Glim or some of these other, other kind of uh, base R packages. Um, we just have a kind of a formula in this case. Um, you know, we have our response Y is, is um, uh, we have, we have two predictors, X and Z, that are presumably fixed effect or, or factor variables. Um, and then we're gonna estimate a random effecting group using this, this kind of syntax. Um, so that's, that's like the basic random effects model. Um, if you wanna get fancy and start including the Bayesian GAMS, uh, you can just, just include the same smooth syntax that you would with MGCV. So it's very, very flexible in that regard. Um, this example is just, you know, it's a, it's a one dimensional smooth, but um, there's really no limit. Limit. You can include two-dimensional smooths and fit spatial models and a bunch of other, um, you know, really powerful type of, of relationships. Um, and you know, when we taught this class two years ago, for example, um, you know, I don't think that the ARMA type uh, models were in there yet. But I think as of about a year ago, um, you know, they they have been included now. So now you can fit um, you can in, fit kind of ARMA time series models. Um, so these are, uh, this is kind of the syntax for doing that. We're not gonna do that for this class, um, but I think that uh, the only thing that I wanted to highlight is that this kind of ARMA model um, is not the same as, uh, as like, um, you know, an, an AR process in a state space model is different from an AR, AR time series model. And so that's gonna be the major difference. So this doesn't include um, the BRM pack, BRMS package doesn't include state space models. If you want to try to fit those models, um, we're going to have to kind of write the code ourselves or use the code that, that we're developing for this class. Um, okay, so just to illustrate how this kind of works um, and how what we do, we, what we can do with the output. This is just a simple um, um, air miles data set where we have um, you know miles traveled by year. Um, we see just essentially the, this uh, linear or exponential increase, but it's linear in log space. Um, what I wanted to just do was, was, you know, illustrate kind of a regression and AR1 approach where in the top we can fit the model using um, BRMS uh, where we're just including year as a, as a slope. Um, and in the second case, we're going to not include year as a slope, but we'll include, uh, we'll include that ARMA error structure. And so um, this is essentially the, the extent of the call. As I said before, you know, in terms of best practices, we want to fit the fit the models with using multiple MCMC chains. Um, the default here is going to be four. We want to um, we want to do this for um, you know at least a few thousand iterations. By default, it's gonna it's gonna use uh, a warm up or burn in period of about a thousand iterations and two thousand after that. Um, generally, you want to fit this a little bit longer. So if you're going to write this you know write this up for a paper. Um, it's often the case that you want to fit maybe a model with 5,000 iterations, but that's that's very different from say the the JAGS universe where you would want to fit a model and run it for 50,000 or 100,000 iterations. So Stan is just not not only um, you know uh, faster because of its speed, but it's faster because of of the um, the increased efficiency of of uh, generating fewer samples from the posterior. So. Um, that's, so that was kind of the fitting the model. Um, so then I guess if we're going back a slide. So this, this object I, I, this object that I'm, I'm fitting is just kind of the, it's called LM underscore AR. It's just the output that's, that's returned from this model object. Um, and then we can do all kinds of things with it. And so I think by, by default, the plotting is gonna be to show the density estimates of each of those parameters. And so this is our, 
you know, we had a, an intercept, a variance parameter, and then the, the AR1 um, or phi parameter. So we get density estimates and then those MCMC chains. And I think when we're just kind of eyeballing these, what we want to see is that the, the chains are, are going to be converging on the same values. And so um, if we look at um, where all four chains are ending up, they look, they look to be pretty similar. Uh, we don't want to see any trends in those, those chains. And so um, we don't see that here for any of these parameters. Um, we don't want to see, uh, we don't want to see um, parts of the chain that wander off into weird places. And so if, if you saw one of those chains kind of bouncing along and then, um, and then all of a sudden halfway through the, the estimation, you know, halfway through the, the iterations, it jumped up to a value that was twice as high as before and then, then stayed there for a little while and then jumped back down. That would indicate that that something is not quite right, or or the model is is probably poorly specified. Um, but in general, these are you know this simple model, simple data set. Um, this all looks looks good, and so this is the kind of result that you want to you want to see. Um, we can look at kind of the correlations between parameters in terms of the the posterior space. This is um, you know it's a it's a very simple model. These are not. This is just um, uh, just a diagnostic. Um, there's nothing good or bad about these. Um, but it's just one of the one of the really simple plots that we can get out of these these objects. Um, the other useful thing I think is what's called the posterior predictive checks. And so I think that um, in the Bayesian model, one of the things we can do is for every for every set of parameters that we generate or sample, we can we can take that and then we can simulate new data. And so the this is a really powerful tool because it lets us it lets us essentially check how, how misspecified our model might be. And so I think um, the, um, you know, in this case, we're just fitting a, this, this time series model. What we're doing is for every, every combination of that intercept, the, the, the sigma and the AR1 parameter, um, generating an entirely new data set. And then we're making a histogram of, of that total data set. And so maybe that histogram isn't of interest. Maybe we would just want to focus on um, the air miles that were traveled in one year, but this is, you know, essentially the black line represents um, kind of what that that histogram would, would look like for our real data. The blue lines are the simulated ones, and so we want to see there. We want there to be some correspondence between those blue lines and the black one, and, and in this case, we we definitely see that. Um, if this looked multimodal, if the blue lines were multimodal, or um, or slammed into really small values that were away from our data, that would be more indicative of a problem. So I think these are just these are just kind of diagnostics that we want to look for um, in in fitting these types of models. Um, but but there's a lot of uh, powerful tools out there. Um, the other thing that I'll talk about uh, toward the end of lecture is uh, there's a really cool interactive R package called uh, called Shiny Stand that will um, that will take a kind of a fitted model object that we can fit in Stan, um, and then it will launch a, launch a Shiny app in a browser and let us explore a bunch of diagnostics and, and fit. So it's, it's, it's a really cool way to, to check things quickly. Um, uh, but I'll demonstrate an example of that toward, uh, you know, toward the end. Um, so as I said before, there's, you know, there's kind of this whole universe of, of um, R Stan ARM and BRMS packages. There's a bunch of, uh, there's a, a couple um, add-on packages that have been developed to do plots of all of these. And so I think in addition to the, the default plotting, um, there's a package called Bayes plot that lets you make a lot of, of different kinds of plots. Um, uh, the pairs plot that I showed before was actually coming from Bayes plot. So I think um, that's just something to be aware of if you, if you start using, using Stan or using these Bayesian methods. And I think Bayes plot is actually compatible with, uh, with JAGS models and a few other other kinds of, of, estimation, of Bayesian estimation uh, models that are out there. Um, if you're interested in doing more of the stand output, I'm not going to get into it um, you know, today. I think there's a lot of really great resources, though, out on the web. And so I think um, in addition to the stand manual, there's a couple uh, Bayes plot and tidy Bayes tutorials out there that I think um, that I've gotten a lot, of, a lot from in the past um, and I think have been, uh, been really good resources. So check those out. Um, okay, so I think <coughs> that's essentially what I'm going to talk about for, for BRMS. Um, as I said, you know, BRMS is super powerful. 
the um, the limit the primary limitations in my mind are that it doesn't it doesn't do a great job handling these kind of multivariate time series models that we might be interested in for this class. Um, just as an, as an aside, I didn't talk about this before. Um, you know, Stan doesn't also do a very good job with um, like the, the hidden Markov models, uh, where our state space model is kind of uh, a wandering around in discrete space, uh, as I was talking about last week. And so I think um, I'm not going to talk about those models today, but um, but that's just another difference I think between Stan and, and Jags. Um, but for uh, I guess the so, so yeah so. Um, Back to, back to BRMS, the other kind of limitation is that it doesn't include state space models. And so the state space models with like an autoregressive parameter, which are really simple to fit in Mars, those kinds of models are just not in BRMS. And so, um, so Eli and Mark and I you know, realized five years ago or so when we started doing it, the, the stand part that we needed to develop those models ourselves. Um, so, uh, so as part of that, you know, I've, I've developed a series of these these kind of R packages that have bundled a bunch of this code. Um, it's all on. Uh, I think most of it's on our um, site for this class, and I'll be talking about um, one of these packages today and a couple on Thursday. Um, they're all super powerful. I think um, uh, you know we keep updating them and adding features to them. But you're certainly welcome to use them for this class, or certainly welcome to use them uh, kind of beyond for um, for your uh, you know, grad school work or um, down the road. If you find snippets of code that are up there that are useful, feel free to uh, to just uh, work, just borrow and and, and go with it. Um, so the way to, to install that package, I think I don't remember. I don't think we've talked about this for this class. Um, but if you've never installed a package from GitHub before. There's a library that you can get um, on uh, on in R called DevTools, and once you install DevTools, you also need to install uh, kind of the R stand package, which lets us compile stand models, um, and then we can use the um, the DevTools package to install this uh, this package um, from our uh, sort kind of course website. So the, the first package that I'll be talking about today is this package called Atsar. Um, and so this has evolved over time, but, but currently the functionality that I'm, I've, I've only included here is just fitting models to, um, just fitting univariate time series models. So the other packages we'll talk about next week are gonna include some of the multivariate extensions like, um, like the multivariate time series uh, Mars type models. Um, if you try this, I guess if you try this and you have any problems, uh, let me know. Um, I, I've tested this on uh, on both Mac and PCs, and it seems to be building okay. But um, it, you know, if there are if there are issues, just certainly um, either create an issue on GitHub or or just email me. Um, so the type um, of, yeah, quick uh, comment. Yeah. So um, if you are on a Windows machine. Mm -hmm. Um, you, there is a setting that you might have to change, and I guess just email me if you run into that. Um, it's also in the um, if you look on the lab in the lab book mm -hmm. um, where we talk about inst installing packages, it's listed there the setting that you might have to change. And this is only on Windows machines, and it happened in. I think R 4.0.1, it's, it's a really new, um, a, a really new thing. So you might've had, never had any problems on Windows machine. I have a Windows machine, never had problems. And then when I updated R, suddenly nothing built. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's really simple to fix. Okay. Um. Yeah, so I think yeah, with with especially with the yeah I, with the update for R, I, I primarily on a Mac, but I, I was having problems with R 4.0 and not being able to build stand packages, um, uh, even until a month ago. And so I think that things have, have kind of been worked out now. But if folks have problems, just to let Eli or I I know. <coughs> um, so the the types of models, univariate models we've included here are, um, you know, random walk and and autoregressive and moving average models. Uh, with and without drift. Um, we've included DLMs, uh, which Mark has talked about a couple of weeks ago. 
um, state space models, state state space flavors of the random walk and autoregressive models. Um, and um, in addition to the, you know, each of these these types of models, we've also included uh, uh, the option of making the response variable something other than a normal distribution for all of them. So you can include um, all kinds of families. Uh, it's fairly easy to add others if you have, if you are, you know, someday working on this and you have data that is, um, you know, student T distributed or something, we can include that very easily. Um, okay, so just to highlight kind of the applications of, or the kinds of things that you can do with this, um, uh, this package. Um, I was, I, I started grabbing the kind of this, this neon um, forecasting initiative uh, data set. And so they have, they have a couple data sets up on their website. I thought the one that would be um, fun to play with initially uh, and probably the one that we'll work with on Thursday is data from this, uh, this Barco Lake in Florida. There's, um, there's about four years of data. Um, and um, what I've done is I've filtered just essentially the last two, uh, only because the, the first two years of data are, are pretty patchy. And so I think um, here we have, you know, nearly, nearly continuous daily sampling um, uh, going back for the last two years. Um, this is a time series of oxygen data from this lake. Um, they also have recorded data for temperature. Um, and so there's, you know, there's an interesting, uh, interesting model um, in that, um, you know, there's, there is certainly some seasonality, um, but there's also just some, um, some differences between years that might be uh, due to non-seasonal things. And so I think, um, you know, both of the, both of the oxygen levels are highest kind of at the early part of the year in January um, or late December. Um, but uh, if we compare say the 2019 data to, to 2020, um, oxygen data is much more variable in summer months in uh, 2019 versus in 2020 when it was both higher and, and less variable. So I think, um, uh, so initially what we're gonna do is kind of just take we, we have temperature data, data too, like I, like I said, and on, we'll talk about that more on Thursday, thinking about the multivariate uh, type, type uh, problem. But um, starting with this data, what I wanted to do is just fit some of these, these univariate time series models, uh, talk quickly about the output and, and the kinds of things that we can do with them. Um, so these are, uh, you know, these are daily measurements. Um, the, uh, the types of models that we'll be fitting um, you know, we can fit a, a number of different kinds, but we'll focus on the autoregressive and the random walk models. Um, so just starting with this, this first model, um, this is just a random walk. Um, so there's, uh, you know, this would be very familiar where the um, expected value um, or expected oxygen at uh, time t is just the expected oxygen at time t minus one plus some error. Um, we, uh, so in the at SAR package, um, the only function that you can really call is this fit stand function. And so when you call fit stand, um, you have to pass in the name of your, your data, which um, in this case, I've, I've uh, created a, a data frame of the, the neon data. Um, it's also in our, in the folder for this, uh, for this lecture, and I'll link to that um, uh, when, I, when I add some more links uh, after class. Um, the arguments here, the other, the other arguments to, to focus on are uh, the model name. And so the model name lets us basically alternate between fitting a random walk model or an, or an AR model. Um, and then the S drift uh, is just, uh, just a flag that turns on whether or not we're including a, a drift or a trend term. And so if we were, you know, this is a very familiar model. It's, this is about the simplest model we could fit. If we included a drift term, um, <clears throat> we would just add a, you know, a scaling parameter. Um, so um, uh, maybe mu, and we would just add that to the to the right side of the equation. So that drift would be just a constant um, constant level that would be increasing um, increasing the value of you know essentially modeling the trend over time. Um, going back to the data that we were looking at before, the oxygen data, it didn't really seem seem like there was a trend beyond kind of the seasonality pattern that seem to be really driving things. 
um, but we can explore those those types of models um, if we if we want. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of the first the first three arguments. By default, I've kind of set um, similar arguments for the MCMC parameters to what the BRMS package does. In that, you know, we're going to fit three three chains by default, um, two thousand iterations, um, a burn-in period of five hundred iterations, uh, and then no thinning. And so, um, that's fairly standard. Um, and then I think if we want to, um, you know, take that model. Um, so one downside, if I just go back two slides to the equation. Um, one downside in this is that we can't fit, uh, we can't do, do a good job making predictions um, for time steps where we don't have consecutive observations, right? Because this is, a, this is an observation error only model. Um, it doesn't include, um, uh, it doesn't include um, the state space component, which we need to estimate what the true state of nature is uh, given, or I'm sorry, this is the process error only model um, given, our, given our data. So I think, um, so what we wanna do is extend this to include that state space component. Uh, and we'll do that here where we have, now our state equation is just kind of our, our X's. So, so the, the true oxygen at time T is the, you know, the, the true unobserved oxygen one time step before uh, we add some autoregressive parameter uh, and then some uh, some process error noise. This noise is assumed to be normally distributed with some mean zero and 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 standard deviation Q that we estimate. Um, so this is just just like Mars. Um, the observation error equation is what links our data, so the the oxygen measurements to our predicted states. And so again, we use the same kind of um, notation as in as in Mars, where we have some standard deviation, a uh, little r here that we, we are using to estimate the variance of, of that observation noise. Um, so we can, uh, for this exercise, we can just take these two models. Basically, I wanted to look at a model with and without this V parameter, um, fit them both to the data. Um, so we're just gonna compare the random walk to the AR1 model to that, that, um, that oxygen data. Um, so before, you know, the, the, other, the other two kind of flavors of models that we can fit um, are just changing the, the model name argument here. So um, if we want to fit the model with, uh, with this fee parameter, it's just going to be an AR1 process. And so um, there's a, a state space or SS underscore AR model that, that lets us fit that, um, that kind of formulation. Um, the SS underscore RW model lets us fit the, uh, the model without that V parameter. So just modeling the, the daily oxygen as a, as a random walk. Um, so you can fit these. Um, they both, I think like in practice, uh, uh, they each took uh, quite a bit longer than I expected to run. So I think um, I was running them yesterday and they each took about a half an hour, which I, I think is still a little bit slow. Um, I think the large part of that is just because uh, we have so many uh, so many observations, and so these are time series that have about you know it's, it's two years of data, so it has 750 states it's trying to estimate. In addition to the you know the few variance parameters and this this fee, so um, so maybe that's reasonable. But I was thinking I can try to sp speed that up a little bit. Um, but just still be aware if you try to run this, it's going to take a little while to just kind of uh, churn through these. Um, so then once we fit our model, I think one of the first things that you should do uh, in practice is just kind of ask whether these models are converging or not. That's a big thing of the, you know, the, the, the plots that I showed you before are one easy way to kind of eyeball whether things are converging or not. But uh, we really want to do something more quantitative because if you, if you write in a paper um, that, you know, the, the plots look good um, to a reviewer, that's not going to, that's not going to cut it. So um, we want some more quantitative summary. The way, um, you know, one, one way to do it is to, to do a couple of these diagnostics. There's a, in these, these STAN objects, one of the measures of kind of convergence is, uh, is what's known as R hat. And so you get an R hat value for each parameter. Um, and that's a use, useful indication of whether things are having estimation problems or not. And so, um, and so in this case, we're just gonna look at the, the two R hat values for the process and observation error from that random walk model. Um, 
that's what the table looks like down down below. And you know, general rules of thumb are that you want these to be to be small. They can that they never can be they never can be less than one, but you want them to generally be like less than 1.1 is kind of a, a pretty good rule of thumb, maybe less than 1.05. And so the process standard deviation looks looks uh, looks good. And the um, you know the observation error standard deviation is is also not not terrible. So it's if these were like 2.3, um, that would be indicative that something else was going on. So these all these all look just fine. Um, and then you know the other another diagnostic is uh, we can look at the kind of the summary uh, the summary fit of this object and look at kind of what the maximum the largest R hat value is across all of the parameters or all of the estimated states in the model. And here it's only 1.11, which um, which is still maybe a little bit high, but uh, you know, just as a reminder, I ran, only ran this model with one chain and um, and only 2,000 iterations. And so I think if we were doing this for for a paper or something, we would we would double or triple that. And so we would definitely expect this model to to converge. Um, okay, so the other the other way you can deal with output from these stand models is for folks who are using the tidyverse. Um, the the broom and the broom mix package are really great for just taking taking the, these objects directly and then spitting out um, uh, you know tibbles to work with. Um, so this is uh, you know for for example we can the broom mix package is kind of the default for using uh, for for playing with stand models these days. Um, and what we get is when we pass in our our fitted uh, stand fit object. So in this case it's the autoregressive model I used. Um, we get a, this, this tibble out, and this includes, it's basically a data frame that includes um, every parameter is a row. It gives us the, the estimate, which is the posterior mean, and then the standard error of that estimate. And so, uh, so it's super easy to take, um, you know, kind of the, these estimated coefficients or for the, this tibble, um, and then just plug it into, you know, ggplot to look at our kind of model predictions. Uh, I should have changed the transparency on this, but um, the things to highlight the gray regions here. So this is a this is just a ribbon plot, uh, just showing our uh, posterior mean of oxygen at each time step, and um, the intervals here represent the ninety five percent credible intervals. And so I think the um, you know unfortunately the gray blobs that you see are basically the only periods where we don't have we you know consistent data. Um, those so those periods like with the Mars model. Um, or any any state space model, as we stop collecting data, our uncertainty just balloons, and it balloons whether we're using maximum likelihood or Bayesian methods. But we see these blips, like in the middle of the time series, where if we stop collecting data for two weeks, we really don't know what oxygen level is 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 going to look like. And so I think that's where this uncertainty is really coming from, and the uncertainty increases the further away you get from real data. So I think. Um, that's why this is ballooning and, and largest in the middle of the, the period. So, um, so overall, these are kind of like our, our I would say that, um, you know, overall, the estimates appear to be very, very precise. Um, so there's, there's just not much uncertainty here in the process. Um, you know, if these, if these ribbons were much wider, we would have a lot more uncertainty, but, uh, but it, seems to, it seems like um, we're getting a lot of um, a very precise estimates. We can then uh, kind of overlay overlay our data on top of this, and so these are the you know the daily data. I probably should have made um, uh, the red plots more transparent uh, or brought the ribbons out, but it seems to be it seems to be that the model is fitting the data really well. Um, another way I wanted to plot this was instead of uh, you know overlaying the predicted and observed values, we can just make like an x y plot of the predicted and observed. Um, and so in this case, um, you know, the, the fits of the data are, are basically perfect. Um, and it's not, not terribly surprising. Um, these, um, so this is our, our estimated state, estimated oxygen on the x-axis and the truth on the y uh, with a one-to-one -one line. And so the R squared between those is, uh, you know, 0.99, it's, it's super high. Um, it's kind of what we expect. I think, you know, a Mars model would basically do the same thing. Um, uh, because it's uh, you know it's such a flexible model because it has these two sources of variability um, and so it's 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 letting the model and it's a random walk so it's letting the model uh, really really uh, fit all the data including the extremes. 
Um, okay, so the kind of the last uh, flavor of, of these models I wanted to um, uh, demonstrate using this ATSAR package was fitting, uh, fitting DLMs, which Mark talked about. And so, um, so we've included kind of three different, three different versions of these DLM models. Um, just for comparisons, I wanted to, um, from what Mark talked about a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to take the same um, kind of logit transform salmon survival data set from the Columbia River, um, where this is um, kind of the logit transformation of salmon survival for about a 40 year uh, time period. Um, the ways that we've coded up the DLM in Stan are to have that random walk be, um, you know, you can set it up so that the random walk is in the intercept. Um, you can set it up so that the random walk is in the slope parameter. Um, in this case, we don't have a, you know, if, you, if, if we had a covariate, uh, which Mark had some examples of, a, you know, uh, including temperature, for example, you could have a random walk in the temperature in the temperature and have the intercept be constant. Um, or, you know, if you had enough data, you could also try to fit a model where you had random walks in both. And so I think um, for this for this illustration, I'm not going to bother including the covariates. I'm just going to include um, the simple uh, the sim simple uh, DLM with uh, a random intercept. So um, so the way that we do that with our um, with our ATSAR package is uh, you know, we can specify these different types of DLM using um, by using for the model name argument, we can specify DLM intercept um, or DLM slope. Um, and then just everything else is exactly as before. Uh, we pass in our data now, our data are different. They're not the, uh, the, the, the oxygen data, they're the same in survival. So we, we pass that in differently. Um, and um, one of the things I didn't show before was, you know, the, so the, the broom and the, the, the tidy R uh, package is, is really useful for pulling out those, um, those raw, raw values or the parameter estimates. If you wanted to have the, um, the raw parameter draws from each MCMC chain, though, I think that um, there's, a, there's a few functions uh, in R stand that are useful for, for extracting those. Um, I guess I, I should have had the code for this. Uh, yeah, anyway, I was, I was meaning to have the code up here for this too. Um, and I'll fix that before I, I post the final version. Um, but basically the, the extract function, what's, what's kind of nifty about that is that lets you take out um, either the parameters or the predictions um, and look at those, not just the posterior mean and the standard error, like we were doing with the tidy, um, um, uh, the tidy R function, um, this, this lets you take uh, look at look at every value um, for each chain. So going back to some of the initial trace plots I was showing, you could ask questions like, are these um, you know do there appear to be coherence between where the chains are ending up and, and kind of synchrony? Are they sampling the same distribution? And um, so if you're having convergence problems, it's a really helpful way to to really dive into uh, to what's going on. Um, and so these are the predictions and um, uh, predictions and the, and the kind of the, um, the ribbon plot showing those um, credible intervals for, uh, for the predictions along with the real data. So just like with the Mars model, um, the Bayesian DLM does a great job. Um, this is another case where the models are very flexible. You, you'd essentially expect to get the exact same answer out of, out of both approaches. Um, I'm actually going to use this example, though. I was talking about that shiny stand uh, tool. I'm going to I'm going to switch my screen right now and show what that looks like real quick before um, we end things. Let's see here. Um, so. So hopefully everybody can see my R, R Studio screen. So I'm doing um, shiny stan. Do I not have this? This would be funny if I didn't have. Uh... Sorry about that. That's silly. Um, Okay, let's try this again. Um, so we'll do uh, shiny stand 
launch shiny scan and pass in our model this fit. Um, so this is kind of the thing that pops up. Our model name is DLM underscore int, which is our kind of fitted model. Uh, I'm going to click on the diagnose um, button for these parameter diagnostics. Um, and um, there's there's probably there's way more options than uh, than than uh, you'll probably find useful. But um, we can do things like um, look at uh, some of these plots by parameter. So if we want to look at um, you know, essentially the, the trace plot of, um, this is our observation error variance. So this is a case where the, you know, the MCMC chain is um, wandering around much more slowly than we probably would like. And, and in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, this is a case where you might want to apply um, thinning after you do the estimation. Um, so that would be one way to fix it. Um, another way might be might be that we only ran this for like a you know a thousand or two thousand iterations. So maybe we just didn't. Maybe it's still in this burn-in period where we would need to actually run the chain more um, before doing any any diagnostics or summaries like this. Um, one of the other issues that it shows is this shows kind of the log posterior, which is you know it's proportional to the log likelihood. I was talking about kind of these weird banana-shaped surfaces before. This is showing um, the x-axis here is kind of our observation uh, error variance or standard de standard deviation versus that log posterior. And you know, in an ideal world, they might be closer to kind of a, a random pattern or a shotgun blast. Here, what we see is more of this like you know there is some uh, you know some relationship here and um, some some strong correlation. And so um, some of that can just be the model, but I think uh, it's definitely an indication where. Uh, things that maybe also not not converge very well. Um, changing the priors would be a third way to kind of deal with this. And then the fourth is, you know, we only ran, I only ran one MCMC chain for this example. So in an ideal world, we'd run this two or three for two or three more chains at the same time. And if all the chains are, are ending up at the same values and show similar behavior, maybe that's okay. Um, but it's hard to tell with just looking at um, one really short MCMC chain. Um, so there's a lot of stuff here to play with. We're not going to talk about uh, anything else, but you're welcome to um, to explore that kind of on your own. Um, so the other one of the other things that um, that I, I didn't really um, have time to talk about are um, you know these additional families. And so I think um, a lot of folks, either for class projects or or for um, for real world applications, um, ha have data that's not normally distributed. So you might have uh, presence absence data or count data. Um, we've included a large number of, of families in these packages too, so that you can basically fit a DLM and have, have non-normal responses. Um, so these, these types of DLMs assume that the underlying state is a, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the process error deviations associated with the state, uh, state model are normally distributed in log space. But, uh, but layered on top of that are these observation models, which are non-normal. So um, all of these are very flexible um, um, and it's kind of a, a ongoing work of, of or it's, it's an area of ongoing research and development. Um, okay, I think that that's, that's just about everything that I had for today. Um, you know, the, the Bayesian implementation is, is certainly complementary to Stan, it can do um, you know, essentially all of the models that, that Mars is doing. Um, for the, the types, like I said before, I think that in a lot of cases, you're going to get essentially, uh, you know, very similar answers between the two. Um, but, um, um, and Mars is, is, is faster for, for a lot of those cases. But for, uh, for other models, you're going to get, um, get some, uh, some differences. And it's important to identify when those, when those exist. Um, you know, the, I really like working with the, the developer community and, and uh, folks who are developing Stan. Um, it's a widely used resource uh, by a lot of folks in SAFs and Quorum. Um, so I think that there's a lot, if you start going down the road of using Stan, there's a lot of people who are interested in working with you or helping you. Um, I'm certainly interested and willing to field all kinds of questions that folks have, uh, you know, beyond the scope of just this class. So please come to me if you have issues. Um, these packages are also certainly, uh, you know, they're, uh, they've been developed for the last few years. They're still being developed and think we're adding things to them. 
um, previous students have added things to them. And, and I think um, if you have errors or issues or want to add features, um, please, uh, we, we'd love to help and uh, we'd love to collaborate on that. So um, I think with that, uh, we will uh, stop for today. Um, okay.